Our guest today, Christine Hassler, is a successful life coach. She is a motivational speaker and author of the new book, The Expectation Hangover, and she's going to tell us what exactly that means. Mm. Thanks for coming. Oh, it's so fun. I'm so happy to be here with you. Now, what is an expectation hangover? Well, you probably haven't heard the term because I made it up mm -hmm. because I had many of them. But it's when everybody, anybody who's ever been disappointed has had an expectation hangover. So it's basically when one of three things happen or a combination. Either the desired result or outcome that you wanted or expected doesn't happen. You know, you have a great plan and things don't go according to plan. Yeah. Or you get the goal, you achieve it, you have the result you want, things turn out exactly like you expected but you don't have the feelings you thought you would. For instance, you get the job you've always wanted and it's not so great. Like you don't have the creativity or the joy you thought we'd have from it. Mm -hmm. Or life just throws you a total unexpected curveball. You lose your job, someone in your life gets sick. Even a parking ticket is an expectation hangover. So the symptoms of an expectation hangover are, are similar but a little more severe and long lasting than those from an alcohol hangover. Mm -hmm. So everybody who's ever had a hangover knows that they're awful, right? I don't even know what you're right. talking about. Right. I mean, neither. I mean, neither. I never had one. Um, they're, they're terrible and you just want to get them over with. Mm -hmm. So your head is aching, there's a sense of regret, you lack motivation, you're thinking about the past and you just want to stay in bed. Disappointment can be the same. Our head is aching, maybe not physically, but we think and think and think and obsess so much. We're spinning, the room may not be spinning, but we're spinning in confusion. There is that sense of regret. We lack motivation. We become incredibly hard on ourselves. We want to go back and change the past. And again, we just want to get out of it. And when we feel all of that coming on, because Lord knows we've all experienced it, what is, once we can acknowledge it, what is the first step in yeah. healing it? Yeah. Well, the first step in healing it is acceptance. I think, and one of the reasons I wanted to write this book is because I've been in the personal transformation industry for a decade, and there's a lot out there about being happy all the time, mm -hmm. and life being amazing, and, and just positive affirmation your way through anything. And I believe all that to be true on some level. However, we're human. And we learn through contrast. Mm -hmm. I do not know any human being who hasn't been disappointed. Because, you know, I know something's hot because I know it's cold. I know light because I know dark. And we grow through challenge. Mm -hmm. You know, as a life coach, most people don't come to me. They're like, oh, Christine, everything <laughs> in my life is fabulous. I'm so happy. I have everything I want. I just thought, you know, we'd chit chat. Mm -hmm. They're like, no, like you mean something. People don't come to you just to have coffee. They well, not really, <laughs> not really. I mean, I don't know if that would be a sustainable business no. because, like, people come because something in their life isn't mm -hmm. the way they want, and so it's through this disappointment that offers us this tremendous opportunity to really grow. So the first thing is acceptance. Mm. Not acceptance and I'm gonna wallow in my misery and have a pity party and be a victim and just go into this pessimistic thinking. I'm not saying that at all. Acceptance means not fighting with reality. Mm. It means, all right, like I lost my job. Okay, I accept it. Mm. Right now I'm gonna stop resisting it or I just got dumped. Okay, I'm gonna stop stalking him on Facebook or whatever, I'm gonna accept it. So acceptance doesn't mean we condone it or we approve, it just means, all right, this is what's happening, what can I learn? And the key in acceptance is to ask that, what can I learn, not why is this happening? Because mm. anytime we ask why, we just go into victim, and the truth is like, I mean, I don't know about you, but there's a lot in my life that's happened and I don't know why. I can look at what I learned from it, but I don't always know why. And that idea of thinking that life is happening for you. Right. It's not happening to you. Exactly. And you say something great in your book that I love, and it goes back to the affirmations, that affirmations are all well and good, right? Yeah. They can be great, but if your belief system doesn't back them up, they're, back them up, they're, you're not going to get anywhere. It, it, it's like going to McDonald's and ordering like a huge, like, burger and fries and then getting a Diet Coke. Mm -hmm. Like at this point, like it, 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 they don't go together, you yeah. know? So if I'm, if deep down I believe I'm not worthy or something's wrong with me, that was one of my core ones, like something's wrong with me, mm -hmm. I'm broken, like those were some of my really tender core limiting beliefs. If I just affirm every day, I'm amazing, my life flows with ease and grace, everything is easy, it's like some part of my brain isn't gonna believe that. Mm -hmm. So. I talk about in the book pendulum thinking of to go from I'm not deserving, I suck, my life, whatever, 
to everything's peachy, our unconscious mind isn't going to believe that because it's just too much of a stretch. So we have to get to more of the middle ground, which is acceptance, like I'm doing the best I can. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a great one to say, yeah. I'm doing the best I can, you know, or just simple, I am enough. Because it's, like you said, it's the belief system that's the wiring. And that's why I, I spend a lot of time on the mental level, like really looking at like what our belief system is. Because like our conscious like conscious mind, conscious thoughts is only three to five percent of our programming. Wow. So we have this other ninety-five percent unconscious beliefs that we can bring into our conscious mind by investigating our belief system Mm -hmm. to really see, all right, like what is it that I truly believe? There's this line and I'm it's gonna take me too long to find it in here, but it was it it is selfish to be a people pleaser. Mm -hmm. And I know I used to do that constantly in my life. I see it happening to friends and family, and yeah. I think we all do. Why is it so selfish? <laughs> Tell everyone. <laughs> I love that. I first wrote about that, and that was one of my most like controversial topics. Mm-hmm. Um, so here's why people pleasing is selfish. People pleasers, as much as they appear to really be concerned about others, the person they're most concerned about is themselves. Because if I'm concerned about what you think of me, I'm actually really concerned about me yeah. because I'm concerned about what you think of me. Mm-hmm. Or if I don't want to upset you, I don't want confrontation, and it's all about self-preservation, mm-hmm. right? So it's not really about necessarily pleasing the other, it's pleasing the other so that we feel okay. So that's why it's selfish. And being selfish is a lot different than being self-honoring. To me... Ooh, stop. Say that one more time. (laughs) So juicy. (laughs) So being selfish Mm -hmm. or self-centered is very different than being self-honoring. I know. What is self-honoring? So (laughs) self-honoring... Self-honoring is about really being authentic, being honest, Mm -hmm. being truthful, and really honoring our values, Mm. right? So if someone does something that's out of alignment with your values, right, it's self-honoring to communicate that, Mm -hmm. right? And if you're asked, like if I asked you to do something for me and you couldn't or you didn't want to, as a recovering people pleaser, (laughs) it's self-honoring to say, I can't, no. Mm. No, another huge thing for people pleasers to, to learn is that no is a complete sentence yes. and it doesn't need like a long, especially with women, like we say no and then we follow it with this long justification and I apology. <laughs> we it's always like, have to have a full excuse full and explanation excuse, for why we can't And I'm can't so make sorry and oh yeah. And you know, what I found with being self-honoring is that then I can serve people. Mm-hmm. rather than please them, right? Because mm-hmm. if my self-care tank is full and I'm taking care of myself and I'm being authentic rather than strategic in my relationships, then like there's so much for me to give. Mm-hmm. You know? It's yeah. sort of like when we have a good night's sleep. The next day we have more energy, we're just more on top of it because our tank is full. And that's what self-honoring choices do. They fill our self-care tank. Mm-hmm. So what was your last expectation hangover? (laughs) Well, you know, there are little mini ones that you you know, you have every day, every time something unexpected happens. Um, But the last one that I actually had to, that I felt, you know, was that I was up for a specific job opportunity and um, not as a career change, but something, Mm -hmm. you know, that's in alignment with my current career. And I ended up not getting it. And at first, I was disappointed. I had that little expectation hangover. Um, but because I you know, wrote this book and had to become really good at dealing with <laughs> expectations <laughs> hangovers. Is that a lot of I, pressure? Oh my God. Well, as an aside, <laughs> like, I, I told all my friends my next book is going to be like, eat chocolate and have great sex. Because <laughs> whatever I write about, I have to experience a lot of. Yeah. So I'm like, why did I write a book on disappointment? Because the, the Years leading up to this book and kind of all the tools and materials, I had mm-hmm. expectation hangover after expectation hangover. So I know this works. It's, I, it's tested. It's and tested approved. and approved. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I don't write anything that I don't, mm-hmm. you know, live through. But with this last one, it was like that kind of oh. But then working through the different levels and really getting to the acceptance and really getting to wow, like, you know, it wasn't supposed to happen. Like there, mm-hmm. there's always, and that's. I don't want to say that it, there's, um, well, let me back up. 
sometimes what people do is they do what's called a spiritual bypass, which is one of the ways in the book I talk about how we avoid expectation hangovers. Mm -hmm. And we don't always want to jump to everything just happens for a reason and then like there's a silver lining in everything because we might miss the, the, learning. the learning in it. Mm -hmm. And so for me, when I dug into like what's, what's the learning for this in terms of why this didn't happen, is it would have required more travel from me. And I've been traveling so much this year. And um, as much as I love it, I, I was missing being ho at home. Mm -hmm. Some of my friendships were starting to suffer. And I was just kind of like running around. And what I really got in it was, wow, like it's this time for me to be, this is time for me to be grounded. This mm -hmm. is time for me to take care of myself and stop doing so much output. It was sort of like the universe going, no, like, time for you right now. And what was that feeling that you had when you experienced it? Was it sort of like you kind of like unlocked something? Was it just like an aha? Was it a feeling? It was, um, I was doing writing about it. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things in the book is I talk about release writing when you just mm -hmm. mind dump. And as I was shifting from kind of the disappointment of it, and also I noticed mentally there was a little judgment about like what did I do or not do to not get it? And and sometimes it's it, we didn't do anything. It just isn't aligned, right? Yeah. Um, but in the release writing of it, I started asking, you know, what, what, like, what am I learning through this? Yeah. And how is this for my highest good? And as I was writing, that's when it came to me of, oh, like, even though my ego and my mind might want me to be in New York doing that thing, my heart and my soul wants me here. Mm -hmm. And it wants me with my friends. And it wants me to get a massage. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So you have these little tips that you suggest for every day, kind of keeping those expectation hangovers yep. when they can kind of come in the moment to, to be like, no, okay, I got you. Like, yep. this is all good. And one of my favorites, and I'm not going to tell you all of them because you should buy the book and learn them yourself. <laughs> but my favorite one, or one of my favorites, was to be like a kid. Mm -hmm. And I tell this to people all the time. I have this thing where I say, you should keep a coloring book. That's in your yes. desk and the second you're taking yourself too seriously or you feel locked up pull out the coloring book and go so when I read that I was like yeah girl I, I love that you just said that because mm -hmm. so after my divorce when I was still living in the place that we lived in together and I was just like it, my divorce was my last big whopper expectation hangover that really was a catalyst for this book and um, we lived right across the street from a CVS and I would seriously when I was feeling down, like, go to the CVS across the street and buy myself a coloring book <laughs> and crayons <laughs> and, like, put on, like, 1980s music and just sit there and color. Oh and it was God, just I so great it. because, you know, I don't, I'm not, a, like, a painter or you give me a canvas and paint, I don't know what to do. But a coloring book and some crayons? Yeah. Love. Yeah. yeah. So you can keep in those lines. Absolutely. Fairly enough. Fairly enough. <laughs> yeah. But any of those things, like, that... Just that lightness and connecting with the things we mm -hmm. used to do as kids is, is so nourishing. Mm -hmm. And do you have a favorite thing that you do every day or you find yourself doing at least once a day that kind of keeps you in line? Yes. Or in alignment? Yes. Um, I have an incredibly devoted spiritual practice, so I meditate every morning. Mm -hmm. And my whole ritual with making my tea and my meditation, and I'm a decaholic, so I have lots of like oracle decks, and spirit, like reading from spiritual uplifting things. I mean, the whole process takes me about an hour. Mm -hmm. And I will get up earlier to, to, do, to it. do it. Yeah. And what do you find by sticking to that practice that the the rest of your day unfolds? Yeah. If in comparison to if you didn't. If I didn't. Well, the first thing is I just I know so many people that check their email before they even pee. Don't do it. It's like it's like I, I it's our addiction to email and our phones is out of control. And when we wake up in the morning, like that's the time when we're most connected to our own intuition mm -hmm. and to a higher power because we're just coming out of sleep, so the veil is a little thinner. And the second we look at that phone, we're pulled out. Mm -hmm. We're pulled out of ourselves and into the world of email or Facebook or whatever else that falls into the like urgent but not important category, right? And so for me, setting my day up where the first thing I'm doing in the morning is nourishing myself and connecting to spirit. It just impacts my entire day. I feel full, I feel like I'm taking care of myself, mm -hmm. and then I find that the people I meet, the way I can impact others, how I can serve others, just multiplies. And I have more opportunities to do that. Mm -hmm. And it feels more in alignment. And, and I'm just more aware like, of the magic 
you know? Yeah. Like, there's so much magic in the world. Mm -hmm. Just little things. So you're saying that hour in the morning is totally worth it. It is, but you could do five <laughs> minutes. Yeah. Just I mean, a little bit of something. Yep, yep. For me, it's an hour because, like, I love it. It's mm -hmm. my indulgence. And then it's always followed by a workout. That's my other thing. Ooh, good for yeah. you. I haven't gotten around to that one yet. I do the morning thing. The workout, I, I'll, <laughs> I'll get there. One day I'll get there. Um, I have to read this because this is my favorite line from your book, and there are a lot of great lines in here. But this one says, creating a life we love from the inside out is not just a possibility, it's a responsibility. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just went, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I feel like we're all gifted to be here, right? Mm -hmm. And the more awareness we have, the more responsibility we have to take responsibility for our life and not expect any external circumstance to fulfill us, mm -hmm. you know? And I think a lot of us get that intellectually at least I got it intellectually, you know, for a while. Like I had a, this crazy career in Hollywood and had everything from the outside world and it never was satisfying. Mm -hmm. It took a while for it to integrate, for me to really like feel like it's in my bones and in my cells of going, wow, like I'm responsible for my life because we really do create our world mm -hmm. with our beliefs, with our feelings, with our choices, with all of that. And I think that how we make the world a better place is starting with ourselves. Because if we do that, and if we take responsibility for ourselves, then the impact we can make on the world just multiplies. Mm -hmm. Because we're not investing, I mean, I invested so much time and energy, and I think this is normal for a lot of people in their 20s, like invested so much time and energy into like, you know, how I looked and how much money I could make and what I could do. And it was like me, me, me focused, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And I think that's normal, um, but I wasn't taking a lot of responsibility. And now I feel this incredible responsibility to just like share and give and be the best mm -hmm. version of me that I can possibly be. And with that, you got the fulfillment. Oh, totally. Mm -hmm. Totally. I mean, I love what I do. I, I love it. And it's not the source of my happiness. You know, our external world is a reflection of our internal reality, right? So the forms that I work in, a life coach, an author, speaker, retreat facilitator, all that kind of stuff, those are more just expressions of who I am. And you know, when I work with people, they so want to know, like, where's the relationship? What's the career? How do I get the money? And I'm like, that's form. We need to focus on essence. Like, mm -hmm. how do you be the most authentic you? And when we do that and we're in vibrational alignment with that, then the forms show up, you know? And I just know, especially living in LA, you know, I know so many externally successful people who internally are not fulfilled mm -hmm. or people that are really busy but not fulfilled or people that checked it, have checked it all off the list but aren't fulfilled. You said in your book, and um, forgive me for giving this away, but I mean, you made out with George Clooney. <laughs> Yeah. If you didn't get full <laughs> fulfillment from that, then I think that tells us everything. Yeah. Well, I have to say it was nice. It was a, it was a, it was a, <laughs> it was a good moment. Yeah. I'm sure. It was, it was nice. It was, it's like, like flying first class. Once you do, you're kind of screwed because you just can never go back to coach. Um, it, it was a new year's thing. And so it was a good excuse to be able to, to kiss him. Um, and what a, what an amazing man. And I remember, being like in this New Year situation, there were other celebrities there, and um, it was a time in my life where I was like kicking butt in Hollywood. And I remember thinking, there must be something really effed up with me because I'm still not happy. Mm. Like that's when it started to kind of sink in, and then things got worse, like all these other things happened in my life. Um, but that's when I started to kind of go, huh, like when is enough ever gonna be enough for me? Mm -hmm. And I really saw, I consistently lived in when thens. Like when I get this, then I'll be happier. When this happens, then I'll feel good about myself. Or, mm -hmm. And I think we do that, like we, we live life based on conditions. So what's next for you? I don't know. I love that answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, people ask me that a lot, like what my five year plan is, what my goals, what my vision. And I, I don't do my life that way. There's a really cool thing I've learned about feminine energy. So funny. That was exactly what came into my mind. Uh, yeah. So I love her. Yeah. <laughs> so 
And, I, and, and being a female entrepreneur, um, I've really had to be aware of this because a lot of my friends and a lot of the events I go to, it's men. And so the way they do things and the, the goals and the vision and the structure and the practicality and the system, it's very masculine. And that works, like it totally works. And I could do that in my business and I'm sure it would work. But it doesn't feel good to me. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about what's next, I think about creating space. So like right now, I'm creating some space in my life and my work because the feminine energy is all about receptivity, right? So we're receivers, like we're yeah. receivers. I mean, let's think about basic anatomy. I mean, I we, are, we are receivers. I, well, so I, I find this endlessly fascinating about feminism yeah. and so much, I mean, feminism is great. It's gotten us very far, but it's all, it's been so much about women can play like men. And let's when we're taking on that masculine masculine energy instead of thinking whoa there are men and there are women yeah why can't we do something really great in the world exactly. but with that feminine energy which naturally would be so exactly masculine it's so it's so different we're supposed to be different we both mm -hmm. we all have both masculine and feminine mm -hmm. but I know and not just because I'm in a female body but I know my essence is more feminine some mm -hmm. women their essence they is more masculine that's where they're happier. But I know my essence is feminine and, and people ask me a lot, like, how do you build your business? I go, I, I receive. So it's not like I sit there on the couch waiting for like the UPS guy to bring me my next job opportunity. Um, I'm very, you know, I'm very aware of my energy. I'm very aware of my own, like my own learning. And I'm also aware of the importance of creating space mm -hmm. so that the opportunities, the people, the situations can come in that are most aligned and also in that space is when I get my creative ideas. You know, I can't take a year long calendar and write out like all my creative ideas and everything I want to do for the year because again, the feminine energy is more about intuition and inspiration. Mm -hmm. And so much of create my creativity comes from with either what's happening in my life or the lives of the people that I'm working with or coming into contact with. So it's like, I don't know what I'm going to be inspired by next week. Yeah. And it would be a disservice to try to yeah. guess and to ignore yeah. what may come up. And women don't trust the feminine. They don't trust that if I, if I just allow some space and be in receptivity mm -hmm. and intuition and creativity, it's like they don't trust that. And they go back into hustling and practical and driving and making things happen and ambition. And you know, it's, Girl, you just rock my world. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, my pleasure. Like seriously, thank you so much. We just rewatch this video and take notes. <laughs> and guys, I'm gonna put a link to Christine's book below this video. Be sure to click on it. Pick up your copy of The Expectation Hangover. And until next time, stay fancy, fabulous, and fun.